Welcome to the second On Farm show during ASB Rural Innovation Week. And ASB has been at the forefront of innovation for quite some time and we really do believe that we're going to see huge improvements on farm over the next three to five years through the use of technology and through innovation. So today we're in the heart of the Waikato, but this isn't any typical Waikato dairy farm with a few different challenges including rolling to hill country. So we're going to talk to the Bennetts and their family operation to see how they're using technology and different feeding systems in order to improve their productivity. So David, what are we what are we dealing with here? How, how big is how big's the property out here? Now uh, the farm's 257 hectares, which uh, 27 hectares of that is lucent. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's the, the size of the property. We've been here since 1993. Uh, when we first came here, it was just a 90 hectare property, and we've managed to add three neighbouring farms to our farm over the over the period of time we've been here. This area is Richmond Downs, um, which is probably the cheaper land in Matamata and that's because of its contour. It's sort of um, steep and to rolling with some gullies. Uh, it's a period silt loam so the soil type's fine but it's just, just the contour sort of puts some people off. Yep. Um, we did 700,000 milk solids here this season just finished or 710,000 so uh, that was about 2,700 solids a hectare and 580 solids a cow. Yeah it's pretty impressive. And you've bought into the business too? Yeah, so I own 15% of the business now. Uh, that includes the, the home farm here, 258 hectares, um, 155 hectares, uh, 500 metres off our boundary down the road, and a 70 hectare dry stock block up under the bush. Uh, so I'm an operations manager here. Um, so yeah, I oversee pretty much everything that goes on. So we have seven full-time staff on the milking platform here, uh, that's including myself, and then we have mum and dad uh, that fill in when required. Okay, so you've got your parents working for you now then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can deal with that all right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's working well. <laughs> yeah, so David, just tell us about the challenges of the of property. We came off a perfectly flat farm in 1993 to this farm, thinking that um, being rolling country, it would be easier to manage. Well, that was a big mistake because uh, cows on rolling country in wet weather can do every bit as much, if not more damage than, than on a nice flat farm. So you tend to have um, you know, gateways that slope to races. You've got sidelings, you've got gullies. The cows have to sort of work their way around. So you've got to be really onto it as far as managing cows in wet weather to stop pasture damage, probably almost more than we were on the flat farm. Yep. And I guess, yeah, I guess the reason we've sort of, we've got to where we are now is we're always looking for new challenges. Um, we always want to do things well. And uh, yeah, we've tried, I suppose, lots of different things over the years. So you're an early adopter of ProTrack? Yes, we, we um, I think we're the 24th one in New Zealand. That's what LSC told us when we purchased the ProTrack. So uh, we built the shed in 2004, it went in then. And yeah, it's been a really good move because, uh, you know, for the animal management side for staff, it's made it just so much easier. Well, when I was milking cows, sort of two, three hundred cows, you knew them. Once you get to sort of 500 cows plus, um, I think you really struggle to, to know the cows. So you've got to have management structures um, and, you know, the likes of the ProTrack really help with big numbers of cows because um, you can manage them better. When we were sold the idea of putting the system in, there was all these benefits that we could, you know, that we as farmers could uh, get from using the system. But we probably didn't have anybody that was really capable or able to drive it as well as it should have been driven. But uh, it hasn't probably been until the last three years that now Jeremy sort of um, has bought into the business and he's really taken ownership of, you know, of the day to day running of the place that uh, he's really using the technology and we're seeing, I guess, some big gains in. Um, and productivity uh, because he's actually driving it. Yeah, so tell us about the technology in the, in the milking shed. 
Uh, yep, so I guess a big part of that is the, uh, the ProTrack system. Um, being able to, to draft cows uh, automatically, uh, it saves staff uh, physically having to look for a certain number and then uh, draft her out because trying to find, uh, for example, cow number 500 out of 1,250 cows is sort of like trying to find a needle in a haystack sometimes. So the cows obviously come on there on the bridge um, and then as they come on they're scanned through a scanner that scans their EID which is up in front of the cows heads there yep. and then so all the through the air through the air tag yep, yep yep through the little button in the air and all that information is then is relayed to the computer behind uh, the milker we have milk meters in our cow shed which are these uh, little boxes up above the, the milkers there so twice a day that's measuring the cows the cows milk um, and that's just enabling us to make management decisions regarding that, so. What have we got here? Uh, so yeah, this is a heat detection camera. Um, so it picks up if a cow's in season or not. Uh, so the camera actually picks up the change in color of a Kmart heat patch. Uh, you see some of the cows going around have, a, have that bluish patch, has a white strip down the middle of it. Yep. So when another cow will ride that cow, uh, there's like a little glass jobby in there that'll break, which will discolour that and turn it red, and the camera up there picks up uh, the change in colour. So that'll determine that the cow's in season. Uh, then, yeah, as she comes around, she'll, as she exits, she'll either be drafted, if you, if you want that, or, uh, yeah, she... She alerts the people at the other side to inseminate her or, yep. or whatever's going on there. So the left hand side is, uh, is cups on, so that's all the cows that are entering the platform are there. The yep. uh, right hand side is the, um, the animals that are exiting the platform. Yep. Um, in this first column here we have the yield, so that's saying uh, how much those cows produced uh, just this night milking. So for example, 5.30 produced 15.6 litres tonight. Yep. Uh, it's got a calving date there, which is the 10th of August. Um, so it's days since calving, so she's been milking for 47 days. Yep. Uh, and then we've just got some other data down the bottom here. Um, so there's 1,298 cows were milked tonight. Uh, 221 uh, went around twice. And then you've just got your platform speed, uh, how many were drafted to the left and how many were drafted to the right. So how do you use the information differently now to previously? We had the information a couple of years ago, but we were uh, probably just not using it as we should have. Um, and yeah, I guess now a big part of my job is looking at that information more often than I used to. Like I just used to look at it maybe once a month and Oh yeah, that herd's producing 26 litres or whatever, but now it's sort of every week you're looking at it and making management decisions. So how many times would you adjust your system? Um, so yeah, like I'm normally drafting cows every week um, from, from herd to herd. Uh, yeah, that's mainly to do with production and diets are changing fairly regularly too. Uh, depends on the amount of, the amount of grass available, um, yeah, the residuals the cows are leaving in the paddocks and the amount of feed that is available. We use a bit of seasonal feed sometimes, so it depends on the time of the season as to uh, what feed we put in. Grass residual, we actually physically have to get out in the paddock and have a look at that. Um, we have used plate meters and bits and pieces in the past and tried to get staff to walk the farm, but um, with varying success, uh, we're quite a rolling to hilly contour, and um, yeah, staff were coming back with some pretty different uh, pasture readings as to how much grass was actually in the paddocks. I guess those milk meters t play a big part into determining um, yeah, if you are getting a response from the feed, so those sorts of decisions are made in front of a computer. Well, one of the big things that um, we're collecting and that we're using all the time is milk information, so individual milk metering. Uh, once cows go past peak, which is 40 days, is, is peak for a, a freshly calved cow. Once they go past that peak, he's looking at um, individual cows, 
weekly basically and he's redrafting them so that the, the best cows stay in the top herd and they'll get the best feed and once they start dropping off peak um, and any of that drop off quicker than they should be get shuffled down so they get a cheaper cheaper ration. We have a high producing high performing herd a medium and a low um, so the high producers are getting all the high cost feeds and I think at the moment they're producing about 35 litres a cow. Mediums uh, sort of getting a, a slightly cheaper ration and then the later lactation cows which mainly go into that third herd are on a cheaper ration again because they're not producing as much and we actually use them uh, like toppers around the farm so the first two herds get fresh paddocks every 12 hours and the third herd go into the most untidy paddock I suppose to, to tidy up and to keep that pasture quality right. We've only ran the three herd system for, uh, we're into our second season of that now. Uh, traditionally we just used to run a, a autumn and a spring herd really and um, we just carried those through and we just sort of used to just blanket feed the mobs. Whereas now in the three different herds uh, they're getting three different rations and um, yeah so you're feeding the, that more expensive feed to those better producing cows and getting a better return. So. What about how important is pasture in your system? The pasture is what we base pretty much everything around really. Um, yeah, how much the cows are going into and what they're leaving behind. The top performing herd are always preferentially fed, so they're always going to a fresh paddock with the, with the best grass available on the farm. They're always getting the, the best supplements available too. Uh, so when we have lucerne in the diet, uh, they're getting their maximum amount of lucerne that they need, and then any excess is fed down through the other two herds. Yeah, so tell us about this herd uh, you know, in the field behind us. Yeah, so these are the, the low producing herd, or the lact lactation cows. So these cows have actually come in here to clean up behind the high producing herd. Uh, so we use these cows sort of as a, as a topper. So for the last 12 months we haven't mown a blade of grass on the farm. Uh, we don't make any silage or anything like that. We try and, well, we do put all the grass down the cow's throat. Uh, we feel that that's the most efficient use of that grass. So you're constantly using as much pasture as you know as possible, and then supplementing with the feed. And that's yep. So um, you know, as we're coming to spring now, we'll start ratcheting the supplements down as more pasture becomes available, um, because if our focus is really on quality, not so much quantity. So um, you know, pasture-wise, so we need to make sure that we keep the residuals right, so that um, the cows keep getting the highest energy pasture that we can give them in this next you know two or three months. After the break more on productivity at the Bennett's Dairy Farm. Back into our productivity story, more on the rationale behind the Bennett's innovative operation. So the three you heard system that you're running, then how did you develop that? Yeah, well, that's come about through, I guess, um, advice from our nutritionist yeah. because um, we always used to feed the cows as a whole group. So regardless of what stage of lactation or um, the whole herd got fed the same ration. And we thought we were doing that you know, reasonably well and, and profitably. But, the, you know, we kept looking for the next, next step, I suppose, in, um, in profitability. And uh, so that was suggested that we should feed the better cows the higher cost and better quality and use the poorer cows to clean up behind the other two herds and it's worked really well. Yep. When you get to a, um, a system like ours, you can make mistakes uh, quite easily yep. by you know, feeding too much um, carbohydrate, feeding too much protein, whatever it might be. Yep. I suppose to get the peak performance, it's like an athlete, you need to make sure that everything's you know, done, done well. And so that's another, you know, an, um, another reason we've employed um, our nutritionist is to make sure that we are doing things well. So um, every time she comes on farm we look for new information and she gives us that. So what types of feed and what mixes are you using at the moment? So the freshly calved cows are all that, the high performing herd. Uh, to get them to peak, we use maize probably as fed all year round at differing levels. We have potatoes in the system that are fed all year round at, at also at different levels, but the high performing herd get the most potatoes because they're high in starch and energy. Uh, palm kernel is fed basically all year round at, um, and not so much to the high performing cows. Uh, we put a bit of canola and soy into the high performers just to give them a bit more 
protein when pasture's a bit short, sort of early spring. And there's a bit of straw going in just for a bit of uh, fibre because of the amount of potato going to those high-performing cows because of the, uh, the starch and the, the carbohydrate they're getting. So yeah, I guess that's basically the ration we're feeding at the moment. And is that consistent right through the year? It, it varies on depending on pasture availability. Um, like in July, June, July, when it got really wet, uh, the cows were probably getting 95% of their diet and supplement, and probably only 5% grass because there wasn't much grass available, and what was there they were wasting. And coming into spring now, that will sort of not flick completely the other way, but will be 70, 30, or 80, 20, you know, grass and supplement. So it really depends on, yeah, on how um, the climate is and how the grass is growing as to how much supplement goes in. Can you just tell me a bit more about your lucerne crop? The main reason for planting so much lucerne was we know protein supplements are the most expensive and lucerne provides that protein. So although it's quite a big outlay initially and you're costing yourself 27 hectares of grass, it gives us some surety around a protein source and we're not open at all to market fluctuations because it's there. This is its second season now, so the first season we yielded about 13 and a half tonne a hectare of dry matter, and uh, this season uh, they tell us we should yield about 18 tonne. As the seasons go on, it, it sort of drops off in yield by about a tonne a year, so it um, should last for sort of five or six years as long as we look after it properly. So we're cutting and carrying the lucerne, um, so it's, yeah, it's getting fed fresh every day. Uh, we're not ensiling it, we uh, actually grew it sort of four or five years ago and ensiled it, but we were having troubles with the quality of silage we were making. Um, I think that was more to do with the process that we were going through than the, than the actual lucerne's fault. Uh, but with uh, green feeding it, we're not getting any wastage due to um, loss of energy or protein for it to ensile itself, to turn itself into silage, and um, yeah, being cut green and fed fresh to the cows, uh, we feel we're getting the best use out of it. So um, David, why don't you just tell us about you know, this block of land? This block's 157 hectares and we'll plant about 70 in May this spring. Well we sowed some on Saturday night which is the, was the 24th of uh, September, so it's the earliest we've had maize in the ground. Normally we're sort of probably 10 days later than that. But um, the, the good weather lately has um, allowed us to get in and get some planted, so we decided we'd fire away and get it in. And we're growing um, Pioneer variety 33 and 54, which is a long maturing, high, or should be high yielding crop. Um, it's the longest maturity one. So what sort of uh, yield are you getting out of this block? block is obviously you know, fairly rolling and things like that. We've found that you know, if we get a good growing season that uh, we think we're yielding between sort of 23 to 25 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. Yep. And uh, because of its proximity to home only being two k's down the road, we can um, get it carted back you know, fairly reasonably. So it's all, all taken home and stacked at home. We're feeding sort of, we have been up to 1.2, 1.3 tonnes a cow of May silage. Yep. So that's been a 25 to 30% of the annual uh, intake is May silage, so it is a big part of what we do. By having the security of owning this block of land and being able to grow 70 hectares here, uh, it gives us a lot of confidence to carry on because we know what this costs us, whereas if we were having to go out on the open market and buy maize, um, you know, there are quite a few fluctuations with uh, dairy payout um, and so on. So at least this gives us some security around supply and, and cost. So you decided to buy all the gear yourself as opposed to contract it out? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we do all the groundwork ourselves, um, which Jeremy was pretty keen to do. He spent a lot of hours in that tractor the last four or five days. And it means that we can do it when we think, you know, the conditions are right. We're not sort of waiting on, some, on a contractor coming. So what about year round? Does this block go back into pasture or how do you handle that? Uh, yeah, we'll probably put this back into annual rye and uh, we'll Last season we actually brought some milking cows down here and, and sent some milk from, from this farm for three months, so that'll probably be our intention to do that again this coming autumn winter. The 
so you're doing you know plenty of different things on farm how have you gained that knowledge um, I, I believe a lot of the knowledge we've probably gained over the years is probably uh, through other farmers and um, you know through field days through uh, going along and seeing what other guys are doing and then thinking oh yep I think we can probably do something along those lines or you know um, make that work at home so that's yeah that's a lot of in a lot of the cases we've seen other you know really good farmers doing things well and that sort of fires you up and gets you going and makes you think right we can have a crack at that too. Advice has come from you know our nutritionist that I mentioned uh, yeah she's she's given us a lot of good information that we've used and seen some real gains um, and I guess just through you know reading the likes of the dairy exporter and well for me anyway uh, Jeremy probably does a bit more research on the internet so um, we don't really try anything unless we've seen it you know succeeding somewhere else or take it from somebody that's a pretty reliable source of information. So what next? What's next? We have been looking seriously at investing some money on farm into some stock housing. So herd homes being probably the, we think, maybe the best option for us. So the herd homes, um, we believe, would give us an option then to take cows off pasture much more regularly than we have the option to do at the moment. Yep. We believe by building some herd homes we could probably grow and harvest another tonne of pasture and uh, also we get, would get the other benefits of effluent storage um, so not having to apply any effluent through you know the wetter periods because it's all going to be stored under the floors and we just pull it out when when we require it some real benefits for the you know the hotter weather in the summertime as well because they're well ventilated and uh, just for cow comfort so that that's one area we think we could make some real gains in i suppose at the moment our milk meters give us a just a seven day average if we could get that uh, daily would be ideal. Uh, just helps us in uh, decision making and I think it will help us pick up sick cows earlier because we'll see a, a drop in milk. The heat detection camera sounds like that's going to be able to condition school cows. That's going to be another good thing to look at and hopefully determine how much weight a cow is losing in a certain period of time. Then there's obviously technology about um, effluent spreading and things like that. Uh, GPS systems getting more accurate to do with that. So. Uh, ProTrack has a lot of other features that we probably don't utilise as well as we should, but um, yeah, I guess it's a great thing about technology. It's always advancing and there's always something new just on the horizon, so that's good. Are there any other areas that you see you know, helping you out with productivity gains? The financial stuff we do, the monitoring and, and so on, has given us the confidence to, um, to keep pushing on, if you like, and keep intensifying, because uh, every step we've taken along the way, we've always looked at the financial benefit or cost of it and um, we try not to make any moves unless there's going to be a benefit. We haven't always done that but uh, that's always our goal is to make sure that we're running a, a farm system that works but making some money as well. So today we've been at the Bennett Dairy Farm in the central part of Waikato. We've seen how they use technology on farm to increase their production capacity and also their profitability. But some of the key things that I've picked up is that it's not only about the technology, it's about the information that they gather from the technology which enables them to make better decisions on farm. If you'd like to be considered for a farm tour of the Bennett's operation, visit the Country 99 TV website to register your interest. And tomorrow we will be following on with the dairy theme, focusing in particular on sustainability. We're going to be looking at two dairy farms, one in the central North Island and another one in Southland. So please join us same time, same place tomorrow for more on ASB Rural Innovation Week.